Lynch singing that. He knoweth the way that I take. He will create a new heart that I may walk worthy and come forth as gold. He giveth and taketh. Number 295. Number 295. Calvary covers it all.
take our Bibles to the book of the Psalms, number 42, Psalm 42. I know this is not a departure from our series in the book of Job, but it is a supplemental passage to introduce us to our message this morning in the book of Job. We will eventually be in Job chapters 11 through 14, but Psalm 42 is our public reading of, of scripture text this morning. I would invite you in honor of God's word to please stand with me as we read this text. We will read it responsively. I will start the first verse and we will alternate and we'll all chime in together on the final verse regardless of whose turn in the rotation it becomes. Psalm 42. As the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My, my soul, soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. For I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God, with the voice of joy and grace, with the multitude that kept holy day. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and of the Nights, from the middle of the Zars. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water spouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. And yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me and my prayer unto the God of my life. I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with the sword in my bones, my enemies reproach me. While they say daily unto me, where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the help of my countenance and my God. Pray. Our God in heaven, we are grateful to be able to come before you and to bring this text to our minds as we many times may feel down in life we know that we can look to you for our hope we pray that your word would be precious to us this morning as we look into it may your holy spirit work in our hearts to lift us up today in jesus name amen you may be seated we have been developing throughout the book of Job a concept that I have called a grief management program, but it is a biblical grief management specifically as brought to us by the book of Job. And we have said to begin with, in the very first chapter or two, we said that grief management according to the book of Job begins with faith in God. And then suggests that we are to trust God to manage our calamity. He then said that we would find comfort in God's love. And last week we said we need to strengthen our faith through patience. That's not always easy either. Today we are adding this line to the slide, hope thou in God. So that is the direction that we are going with our text this morning, Hope Thou in God. The question
question is often asked, what can we safely place our hope in? There are all kinds of things coming at us as far as advertisements that says, this is a good, safe place for your investments. Right now, the concept of the I-bond from the U.S. government, the inflation-protected bond, is currently offering, what, 9.62% or something close to that. The I-bond is uh, guaranteed by the government and is a good and a safe place for you to invest your hopes up to $10,000. There are many other considerations. Where is a safe place to place our hope in the future? And of course, we understand from the biblical perspective, God is in charge of all of those circumstances, even the ones that seem to be guaranteed 9.62% for the next six months. God is still even yet in charge of that. So we are going to look into the book of Job and we're going to find out that the only real safe place for our hope is in God alone. So now we're going to turn back to the book of Job. Job chapter 11. We have been following the dialogue of Job and his three friends. We are coming to the the uh, first instance of his third friend, Zophar. Zophar is going to speak to us today from chapter 11. You may remember, you may recall that we said Eliphaz, Eliphaz takes the position of a theologian emphasizing the greatness of God and his judgment of sin. And we suggested Bildad, the second friend, takes the position of a traditionalist emphasizing the principles of justice and the concept of retribution. Now Zophar is going to take the position of a moralist. This is something I'm getting from my, uh, my study notes in my own reference Bible. But as a moralist, Zophar is emphasizing the principles of wisdom, which he suggests Job has violated. All of these, of course, are taking a negative view of Job and his circumstances. But this is where Zophar comes in as a moralist. He's talking about the principles of wisdom. And uh, right in verse 6 of Job chapter 11, we have his primary statement of reference Verses 5 and 6 together says, Oh, that God would speak and open his lips against thee, that he would show thee the secrets of wisdom, that they are double to that which is. Know therefore that God exacteth of thee less than thine iniquity deserveth. Now, there's a lot of good positive truth to be said for what Zophar is describing. But obviously in the context, the very truth can be turned around to something that is not quite correct. What he is saying, he's making, I've got five different statements that I've written down that he is making. In the first six verses, he's building a case that says what we don't know is double of what we do know. Now from a principle of wisdom, can we argue with that? Well, that kind of implies an interesting concept in your mind. Can you argue that we know more than we don't know? How can you even possibly argue that? Because we have no idea what it is that we don't know. All right, so the other side of the coin must be true. There's a lot more that we don't know than what we do know. And of course, every day we're discovering new things I'm not just talking about discovering new muscles that we didn't know we were there because of hard work. Every day we are discovering new things in science, new ways of doing things. Who would have said a generation ago, or two generations ago, I don't know how far back you have to go, that all of the science fiction stuff where you could tap on your watch and talk face to face with somebody, that you could have done that 60 years ago. That's new technology. We are discovering new things. 
And every day, just as you seem to think that your smartphone is not doing what it's supposed to be smart enough to do, you realize, oh, wait a minute, I'm on Android 7. I should be on Android 11. Huh? Where did that come from? What happened? Well, we've discovered new things. We have bigger and better products. We have to have more memory in your smartphone to make it work. We are discovering more things that we didn't know before. What are we discovering on the surface of Mars? There's lots of things in the news about what the discovery in Mars has been. There's more news discovering things about our most distant planet. Somehow that that's either a planet or is that a star? I, I can't answer those questions. I can read the news. But there are a lot more things that we don't know and uh, Zophar is making the statement, what we don't know is double of what we do know. Now, I don't know how he can come up with a factor of two times, meaning double, but obviously this is one of those statements. The factor doesn't matter. It's insurmountable to consider what it is we don't know. But he carries that a step further in the next statement that he makes where he says that God exacteth of thee less than thine iniquity deserveth. God even forgets some of your iniquity. He's making the statement here that because there's so much that we don't know more than what we do know, even our own iniquity, there's more iniquity that we don't know than what we do know, and therefore God is exacting much less than what you deserve for God to exact on account of your iniquity. Now let's take that statement by itself for just a moment. Is there any one of us who has a level of equity or equity other than the iniquity and you know where I'm going with this is there anybody that does not have even a slight amount of iniquity in their lives no the Bible even tells us there is none that doeth right no not one there is no one who is perfect we have the doctrine of the depravity of man we recognize that no man is qualified for heaven apart from the mercy and grace of God in providing Christ as a sacrifice and by believing in Jesus Christ we have that opportunity for faith in Christ for eternal life and to have our sins forgiven God punishes in this life less than we deserve that is a true statement. And then we get down to verses 7 through 10 where Zophar is telling us, Canst thou by searching find out God? And through the rest of those four verses, God is not perfectly knowable. Verse 9, The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. How can we possibly wrap our minds around God? God is not perfectly knowable. We know that what we don't know is double of what we do know. That may be a true statement. And it is yet in fact true that God even forgets or, or is not imputing all of our iniquity to us. We certainly deserve more than what we have received. God is not perfectly knowable. And then we get down to verses 11 to 13 where... He knows vain men, but sees wickedness also. Will then he not consider it? God recognizes deceit and wickedness. And if all of these statements are true, and God is recognizing deceit and wickedness, therefore this must be why you are being punished by God. Job, you must have sin. And if we also recognize from verses 14 through 20, If iniquity be in thine hand, put it far away. Let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacles. For then shalt thou lift up thy face without spot. Yea, thou shalt be steadfast and shalt not fear, because thou shalt forget thy misery. 
And he goes on to describe how Job's life will be so much better once he just forsakes his sin and comes before God. And then you will be blessed by God abundantly because that is the secrets of wisdom. Interesting that even by his own argument, Zophar is telling us that there's twice as much that we don't know compared to what we do know. This is what we do know about wisdom. Well, guess what? According to Zophar's own argument, there's twice as much about wisdom that we don't know, that is still secret. What he is saying here is that the righteousness that man can accomplish glorifies man. For glory is the reward for doing what is right. As he has just said, if you, if you put aside your wickedness, if you approach God with righteousness, God will bless you, God will reward you for doing what is right. This is the secrets of wisdom that the world holds on to. And sometimes can even be a tempting consideration for believers. But now we want to go forward and look at Job's response in the next three chapters. In Job chapter 12, first of all, we have Job acknowledging God's omnipotence. Yes, there are these things that are true. Job says in the first six verses of chapter 12, I understand all this as well as you. Job answered, verse 2, No doubt, but ye are the people, and wisdom shall die with you. As in, if your understanding of wisdom is all there is, what happens when you die and wisdom is gone? But Job says, But I have understanding as well as you. I can think for myself. I am not inferior to you. Who doesn't know such things as these? He goes on to describe how they're mocking him. Yes, he says, wisdom is no secret. But he says, but explain this in verse 6. The tabernacles of robbers prosper. How is it that robbers and evildoers are equally blessed or prosperous? Plug that into your definition of wisdom and tell us, that righteousness glorifies man. Well, man is being glorified who is his, who are, are robbers and evildoers. Down in verses 7 through 10, in chapter 12, verses 7 through 10, Ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of the air. Or speak to the earth, and it shall tell thee there's wisdom in all of the creation that God has created. Who knows not all of these things. God controls all of these things. We recognize what happens, we can observe and we can make statements about repeated events. That's called science. Based on what we are able to reserve, observe about repeated events. All we can observe is that God is in control of these things. There are things that we think that we can control, we even heard many generations ago, I remember hearing about, talking about seeding the clouds to make it rain. Well, there's been various forms of religions that have thought that they could make it rain by doing certain things. As much as we would like to think that we can start to control a few things of our lives, we must recognize God is still in control of all of these things. Even man's life. Verse 10, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. From verse 11 down through the end of chapter 12, Job is saying, look around for yourself. God destroys both men and nature as he will. Verse 14, he breaks down and it cannot be built again. He shuts up a man and there can be no opening. Verses 17 to 19, he leads counselors away spoiled and makes the judges fools. 
He looses the bond of kings, he girds their loins with a girdle, and leads princes away, spoiled and overthrows the mighty. Down in verse 24, he takes away the heart of the chief of the people of the earth. Causes them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. They grope in the dark without light as he makes them to stagger like a drunken man. God is in control of our lives. Even in verse 15, there was a, a reference that we skipped over. He says, He withholdeth the waters and they dry up. He sendeth them out and they overturn the earth. God is in control of mankind. God is in control of all of nature. And with this chapter and with this sentiment, Job is basically making the statement, God not always glorifies man. We said that righteousness glorifies man was part of the secrets of wisdom of the world, but according to what we can observe within this world, God does not always glorify man on account of man's righteousness. So, we understand we cannot use that secret of the world's wisdom to make the statements that Zophar is making. Then he goes on to chapter 13 where Job begins to defend his own integrity before God. But I, I caution you to think that this is not just Job standing up to God and saying, I'm righteous, as if to tell God what he is doing. But he's looking for that interaction where he says, I know that this is what it is. I just want a chance to prove it. I want to see my accuser face to face and all the rest of that that goes with the, the standard trial. This is where Job is coming from. In chapter 13, Job begins to defend his integrity. In the first five verses, he says, Lo, mine eye has seen all this. My ear has heard and understood it. What you know, the same I know also. I am not inferior to you. Surely I would speak to the Almighty. I desire to reason with God. But ye are forgers of lies. Ye are all physicians of no value. Oh, that ye would altogether hold your peace, and it should be your wisdom. You've heard it said, perhaps, it is better to keep your mouth shut and appear wise than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Job is saying that essentially here, that you would altogether hold your peace, and that would be even wiser. This concept of physicians of no value, you all know what a quack doctor is. And many times we try to play the role of a doctor when we hear of someone that says, Oh, I, I know what you're going through. I had that problem, and this is what I did to resolve it. You should do that. You know, what kind of doctor would say, oh, that's a common symptom. Everybody else that gets this symptom, you know, you just, you just take a little, you know, take two aspirin and call me in the morning type of a thing. Obviously not the same thing applies to everybody. Job is saying, I would reason with God, but I can't reason with you if you're just taking the wisdom that you say is of the world and applying it to my case. I want to have the true uh, doctor, the true physician of God himself. I cannot reason with you because you're just taking the symptoms and applying what you know to be a cure for those symptoms as if those symptoms result were a result of the sin that you are implying. Obviously, the symptoms were a result of something much different that Job did not understand. Verses 6 through 12 here in chapter 13, Job is saying, Will you hold God to the proverbial wisdom? This is my reasoning. Will you speak wickedly for God and talk deceitfully for him? Will you accept his person and will ye contend for God? Will you 
hold God to the wisdom that you've discovered from this world? Would you argue with God that because someone is sinful that they should be punished? And if someone is righteous that they should be glorified? Would you argue with God and say, God, I've done what I'm supposed to do. Why aren't you blessing me in my life? This is the proverbial worldly wisdom. And if that is the case, he goes on in verses 13 to 19 to suggest, let me speak. Let me say what I need to say and then come on me what will. Why did I take my flesh and my teeth and put my life in my hand? Why should I risk my life by declaring myself before God? And yet, Job is in a position of such despair, of having lost all of his physical world, having lost all of his, his uh, property, now having lost all of his health and hanging on only by what little bit of skin is left on his teeth. He's saying, what have I got left to lose to take my life in my hands before God? Even though, verse 15, though he slay me. And here's where we have this statement of faith from Job. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. But I will maintain mine own ways before him. Job is telling us that his conscience is clear. With a clear conscience, he is able to place his faith in God, even if God were to allow Job that last step of relief and peace and rest into the land of those who have gone on before him. He says, I trust in God, and yet I defend my integrity. It says in verse 18, his a statement of faith is concluded in verse 18. He says, Behold now, I have ordered my cause. I know what I am before God. And I know that I shall be justified, or I shall be vindicated. Without knowing his latter end, he is still able to place his faith and his statements in, in God. And the last... <coughs> Last few verses from verse 20 down. Only now, only do not two things unto me, then I will not hide myself from thee. Withdraw thine hand from me, let not thy dread make me afraid. Then call thou, and I'll answer me, or let me speak and answer thou me. I believe he's talking to his friends here. He's not yet speaking to God. I think we'll find that in the next chapter. But he's, he's telling his friends, stop playing God's role as if you know it. Verse 23, how many are mine iniquities and sins, if you know? Make me to know my transgression and my sin. If you're telling me, friends, that I have all this iniquity, tell me what it is. You're playing God's role. And Job is basically making the statement regarding this glorification of man for righteousness. He says righteousness is not always rewarded with glory. He said in the last chapter, God does not always glorify man for righteousness. And in this chapter, he's saying something very similar. He's saying righteousness is not always rewarded with glory. And so we have to understand in our context before God, we cannot always expect God to turn things around the way we would like to do so. And finally we get to chapter 14. This is the end of Job's dialogue with Zophar on this first go-around with his three friends. Job is reflecting on his life woes. I want to highlight three verses out of chapter 14. One is verse 5. His, seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. In verse 5, we have a statement that is a statement of truth about God, that God knows all of our days. In fact, 
God has determined all of our days. Therefore, I can rest my eyes peacefully when I'm riding in the car with someone else driving. When we were first married, I had a big problem with this. I was driving the car and I was in control and I knew what was going on and regardless of what you know risks I was taking, I knew I was safe. But then I let my wife drive. Now she's a good driver. In fact, I will admit quite openly she's a better driver than I am. But for me to sit in the passenger seat and watch her drive and I see her doing things that I wouldn't do, sometimes because I shouldn't, but to watch her drive is one thing, but then for me to close my eyes and not watch her drive, it's like, ew, I, what happens if, you know, what if I'm not watching and I don't see something I should have warned her about? What if we get into an accident because, you know, I wasn't <coughs> able to, you know what? I had, a, I had to struggle with that and I had to recognize. And this is a verse that puts it into perspective for me that God is in control and in fact God has determined my days and my months. And if anything was going to happen, it was going to be God who allowed it to happen. And if God determined that it was not going to happen, it doesn't matter. The worst driver in the world cannot make something happen that God has determined is not going to happen. I could rest peacefully while my wife was driving, knowing that, well, number one, whatever happens to us, it happens to both of us at the same time. And number two, God is in control and God will only allow what he chooses to allow. Kind of the same sentiment I've described back when I was uh, a young boy hanging my toes over the end of my mattress in, when I was sleeping at night. What if that whatever is under my bed comes up and nibbles at my toes? Uh, really young, you know, go way back, long before I get married. I had to realize, you know what, God is in control of all of these things. And if he wants that little monster under my bed to come up and nibble my toes, He's going to allow it to happen, and otherwise he's going to not allow it to happen. And I could rest peacefully, knowing that God was in control. What are your circumstances this morning? I mean, we smile at these little things. But don't we all have opportunities to recognize fear? When we know that God is in control of all things, and he has our days determined, that should give us a sense of being able to rest peacefully in God's control, even if everything else in our life seems to be out of control. Verse 14. Chapter 14, verse 14. If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. I will wait till my change come. Job knew that this wasn't a forever thing. And Job knew that a change would come. And he was willing to wait for it. Then down in verse 17, I want to highlight this verse as well. He says, my transgression is sealed up in a bag. And thou sowest up mine iniquity. It's not just the passive being sealed up, but somehow God is doing something to bind it up. And I have in my center reference an alternate wording that says to plaster over or to cover over. God takes my iniquity. And he sews it up. He covers it over. He does something to take it away from me so that it is not something that is against my account. Do you understand where Job is coming from? Even before the even before Christ came and gave us the doctrine of his substitutionary death. 
He, Job understood that God is in the business of covering over iniquity. Even whatever transgression he might have had, recognizing that even his, his depraved nature, God is in the business of covering over iniquity. Therefore, we can conclude all of this with a single statement that says, man can only trust God and wait for God to bring about what he is in the control of bringing about. How does that boil down to be a little more simple? Man can only trust and wait upon God. Trusting God for what he has said will take place and waiting for that to happen is not that the definition of hope. Knowing that God is in control and God will make things happen and we simply need to wait for it. Jesus said, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. That is a promise. Jesus said it. We believe it. We recognize that we can trust Jesus Christ to fulfill that promise. And thus we simply wait for that to take place. That is our hope. Jesus has told us, and the apostles have told us, that we anticipate the next great event in the history of this world and in the prophecy of God's timing, that we anticipate the rapture of the church, and that is something that has been promised to us through scriptures. I don't have them all at the tip of my tongue right now, but God has promised it, and we trust that God has said it, and it will take place that way. We simply wait for that, anticipating it in all the detail, and that is our hope. This is not a, oh, I hope that that is true. No, this is a promise of God, and this is our definition of hope. Man can only trust God, patiently wait for God. This is the definition of hope. And of course, we cannot leave the service without recognizing this is how to place your hope in God, and that has to do with admitting that we are a sinner and deserving of God's judgment, as Job even described at the end of chapter 14. But believing in what God has said, believing in Jesus Christ has died for our sins and rose again, we can place our hope in God. And then having placed our hope in God, we get to enjoy all the blessings that scriptures give us. Notice these blessings don't tell us that we will become wealthy or that we will be blessed or glorified in any way. But it is simply obedience to God's word. Let's pray. Our God in heaven, we thank you for giving us your word. We thank you for allowing us the privilege of understanding what is being brought to us from the secrets of wisdom from the world. And yet, God, we recognize that our worldly wisdom many times falls short simply because of its own basis that there is so much more that we don't know than what we do. But therein, God, we have the assurance from your word that what we do know from your word is a promise that we can take to the bank. We can take your promises to our heart. We can know that what you have said is going to take place. And that is what we patiently wait for amidst the circumstances that we are facing. Please, God, I pray that you will help each one of us, myself included, to hope in God with patient waiting for that which you have promised. In the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Let's take our hymn book to number 344 as we close our service with this hymn, My Hope is in the Lord. We'll sing just the first verse, number 344.
again, I'm going to play through a verse one more time, and we'll simply meditate on verses two, three, and four. As we do. 